I'm standing here at Limbrook's beautiful 9-11 Memorial, and I'm here to bring you another edition of a few minutes of Limbrook history. Today I'd like to talk about the Depression. We're at pretty hard economic times this year, 2009, and some people on TV and in conversation have casually dropped the word depression in their conversation. But most of them have no idea what the Depression was like, and even if they're old enough to have been through it, very few of you viewers would have actually been here in Lindbrook during the Depression to know what it was like here. It was terrible times back then, 1929 through 1939. 35% unemployment. We may touch 8% this year on Long Island. There were bread lines in Lindbrook. There were suicides here. There were people who lost their life savings, not just in the stock market, but because of bank failures. There was a hobo camp, a work camp for homeless men. Uh, all these things you normally would associate with the big cities, but no, even in a suburban environment like this, things were just terrible. The economy began to slow on Long Island two years at least before the Depression actually hit. But Limbrook was still a good place to come to for work because we had been the fastest growing community on all of Long Island in the mid-20s. And there still were homes being built. Sunrise Highway was being put through. Robert Moses was building uh, parks at Hempstead Lake and Valley Stream. And so men came here to Limbrook. And as times began to get bad and the Depression began to hit, more and more men came. And so Joe Ferrara, a local entrepreneur, built an establishment to house these people, many of whom were actually homeless, as many as, at one time, 130 men, at one time, 200 men, who were right here near Prospect Avenue and Peninsula Boulevard, here in the southern end of town. Joe Ferrara would take their pay from the contractors, take his slice out of it, and then subtract out room and board and give them what little was left. What they lived in were virtually windowless, uh, more like barn structures. Cots were laid out, bed to bed, barely could walk through. Two blankets to a cot, filthy blankets, no sheets, no pillows. They could take a bath once a week. That's all they got. And as things got bad on Long Island and New York City, the population of the work camp grew and grew. Drunkenness, fights, terrible things were happening down at this end of town. So the, the residents originally began to complain about this, and, uh, but never would they want to even do the work that these men were doing. So you can't take the complaints too seriously. But as the depression really hit and 35% unemployment, the residents began to wonder why these men should get jobs that they thought they should get. Much of the work that they were doing was state contracted. Governor Franklin Roosevelt, yes, governor, because he hadn't been elected president yet, he was the governor of the state of New York, got a number of complaints from, the, from residents of the village. Their complaint was that state contracts should not be used for the benefit of what uh, the manager, Joe Ferrara, called bums of the Bowery and homeless men. Give these jobs to Limbrookites. But the contracts, uh, I should say, the letters and the telegrams were largely ignored and uh, these men continued to work and had their camp here virtually throughout the Depression.
1930, the employment level was not doing very well, and Limbrook formed a, a group called the Limbrook Municipal Employment Bureau to help people find jobs. They got very lucky in 1930 because an organization called Yorkshire Homes Incorporated decided to build in this lovely part of town, we still call it the Yorkshire section. Their plan was to build 200 homes. They never did get quite that far uh, at that time because the economy got so bad. But for a while, they provided employment for up to 200 men, many of them from Limbrook. But when that began to peter out, things uh, really were getting bad in Limbrook. And as a solution to it, Limbrook did something that it took the federal government several more years to do when it formed all those um, alphabet code places, uh, groups called NRA, the CCC, the RFC, the PWA, the TVA, and so on. Limbrook formed its own Municipal Employment Bureau. What they did was float bonds at $1.27,000 so that they could find employment for Limbrook men here in a village on projects that would help the village. And so there were things like cutting a road through for Cowell Place. There was the enclosure of Doxy Brook from Hendrickson Avenue down to Merrick Road. And various projects of that sort to put people to work. The short-term projects that the village did, the piping and the cutting through of streets, provided employment for about 100 men. And these men were paid $4 a day. And then the wood that they would chop down from the projects would be given to the poor who couldn't afford uh, any other way to heat their homes. Permanent jobs, though, were really hard to get around Limbrook. And so in late 1930, when five jobs opened up at the village police department, the place was swarmed. Somewhere between 50 and 100 men showed up to take the test. And while I'm on the topic of police, I should also mention that the years 1929, 1930, 1931, and 32, those four years were probably the worst four years for the police department, for sure, and also a very bad year for the fire department. Because in those years, four men died in the line of duty. In the case of the police department, it's particularly tragic because uh, the men had left behind three wives and five children, and there was no insurance to cover them. Uh, and so the women actually had to move in with relatives and give up their homes. Uh, it also was true of the firemen. There was no insurance, no life insurance to cover him either. And so there was a, we have to remember these times, there was no social safety net to cover people. Anything that was done for them, they had to do for themselves or had to be helped by their friends, by charity, and so on. many people have wondered why it is that Limbrook has this cramped little athletic field behind its high school. It's a direct result of the Depression. In the mid-1930s, eight acres of land opened up at Scranton Avenue uh, near Peninsula. Eight acres for use for building a new high school and large athletic facilities. But people became afraid. The board put out the proposition before the voters. A bond issue would have to be floated. Everybody knew it was the right thing to do. It was, again, a no-brainer. But people were frightened, frightened because they didn't have jobs, afraid of losing their jobs, afraid of not meet, meeting their tax payments. And so they voted it down. And so we have today this little soapbox of a ball field here at uh, Limbrook High School, a victim, direct result of the Depression. <laughs>
is a clothing store that once was the People's National Bank of Limbrook. There also was the Limbrook National Bank, a little further north up Atlantic Avenue. These banks were fairly sound. In fact, each of them issued their own currency. Uh, the same $5 and $10 certificates that they issued back in the 20s are probably worth $1,000 today as collector's items. But those, even those banks, as strong as they were, looked shaky by 1933. In fact, in the first quarter of 1933, 3,000 banks failed, closed their doors in the United States. And by the time the Depression was over, 9,000 banks had closed their doors. And so people lost faith in places like this, a bank like the People's National Bank. And some Limbrook residents also lost faith. And so they took those certificates and they turned them in for gold certificates that were backed by the Treasury of the United States. One of those people was Mrs. Carl Fisher. She lived over on 8 Catherine Place. Mrs. Fisher got one of those gold certificates and put it, uh, you guessed it, in her mattress. One night in March 1933, her house burned to the ground. Those gold certificates were as good as gold as long as you had the certificate. But once it was gone, it was not redeemable, it was not replaceable. She had lost her life savings. I'm standing next to the feather factory, uh, abandoned now, waiting for some kind of development. But back in 1929, it was a really going concern. It was the Atlantic Knitting Mills. They employed several, uh, as much as 150, mostly women, work there. But in 1929 and 30, the owners reduced the pay of the people there and extended their hours so that at, by 1933 they were working 60 hours a week and making $8 a week. Well, the people working here, as I say, mostly women and many of them having to support families, uh, found they could not live on that wage, plus being away from their families so much. So they went on strike. What a tough time to have a strike in the middle of the Depression. But they did it. And the owners realized that, indeed, they had been paying too little and working these people too much. And so they agreed to raise the salaries to, eight, to $10 a week. And they reduced their work week to 44 hours a week. Now, people not only had trouble with employment, many people had trouble regarding their savings. And indeed, some lost their entire life savings, and some lost their lives. In June 1930, Charles Waters, his wife and his daughter, were found in a Union Place home, shot to death. The coroner was called in, and he determined that it was a murder, two murders and a suicide. Charlie Waters had been an insurance company executive in Manhattan, and he'd lost his job and he lost everything in the stock market. Later that year, there was another death of a Limbrook man. This was John Allen Baker, a businessman, father of four, and the head of the Limbrook Citizens Party. He suffered tremendous financial reverses and decided to end his life in spectacular fashion. He went to work, went up to his fifth story office, and dove out the window. Patrons in a clothing store below were shocked to see his body crash through the skylight above and end up in a heap of clothing. Incredibly, he survived. But Mr. Baker was determined to end his life, and so later that year, he took poison in a New York City hotel room and died. There was no unemployment insurance in Limbrook. There was no disability insurance, no particular social services. 
And so people were left to struggle on their own. But the charitable organizations of Limbrook reacted in a very positive way to help out. So many charitable organizations began to contribute to the poor that they had to develop a clearinghouse in Limbrook so that the same groups wouldn't be giving donations to the same people and doubling up on some people and leaving others without. I have a list of some of those organizations, the American Legion, the Limerick Mothers Club, the West End Mothers Club, the Council of Jewish Women, the Masons, Temple Emmanuel, St. James Church, the Delta Club, Congregation Beth David, Knights of Columbus, Catholic Daughters of America, and there are more. As I say, they reacted very strongly. Uh, Miss Rhoda Weissman was the secretary of that organization, the Clearing House, they called it, and uh, she wrote a letter uh, to the public. It was printed in the paper, and it's a heart-rending appeal. Back in 18, I'm sorry, 1931, for one needy family that had refused to accept any aid. She writes, "No charity wanted, but an honest endeavor to obtain work." This is the history of one of Limbrook's neediest cases. A couple and a granddaughter, 11, comprise the family that needs assistance. Fearful that their granddaughter, an orphan, may be taken from them should they accept assistance, the couple have refused aid. They have been, on, been existing on bare necessities during the past few weeks and without a substantial meal. Yet all the man needs is work. He's an experienced carpenter, packer, and general worker, who has a job for him? Hunger was mounting in Limbrook in 1932, and so a request went out to the Red Cross to bring in bags of flour. When they did, there were so many people gathered near Village Hall to collect the flour from the Limbrook welfare officer who was appointed to help distribute it that they had to limit the distribution to one bag of flour per person. 2,500 bags of flour were distributed that day in 1932. But despite the charitable organizations, the distribution on the bread lines, there were some people who still didn't get enough to eat and didn't get enough medical care. And one tragic example of that is Mrs. Grace Farrell of Lewis Place. She was 57 years old. Her neighbor used to look in because she knew she was ill and didn't see her one day. And so she called the police who came to the house and found Mrs. Farrell dead. When her husband came home, he said, I've been looking for work all day and couldn't find any and haven't been able to find any for so many months. I knew she was sick, but we just didn't have the money to go to a physician. And we haven't had much food either. I'm standing here at one of the Limbrook's municipal parking lots down near the train station, Village Hall over here, the Limerick Movie Theater off to my right, just behind the Astoria Savings Bank. This was the site of a large bottling company, the Limbrook Bottling Company. They filled glass bottles with seltzer, soda, soda and uh, sold it up and down the south shore of Long Island. When 1929 came with the Depression, their business began to falter. Now in those days, glass bottles always had to be returned. There were no plastic bottles or aluminum cans, things like that. And so they had to wash out the bottles and it was a tremendous amount of water was used. And it would flow down right across into Doxy Brook, which is between me standing here and Village Hall. But in that year, 1929 and 30, the village had a special project for unemployed people. They filled in, or rather they piped in Doxy Brook, so that the water that flowed into the brook could no longer flow into the brook. Instead, it began to flow down towards the train station, where we had more municipal parking and was first being developed. Well, in winter, it would turn to ice, and some of the water would continue flowing down into Sunrise Highway, creating what was called Sunrise Lake, or Lake Sunrise. 
The village fathers became very upset and demanded that the bottling company cease its operations or remedy the situation. So they built a huge drainage ditch, uh, kind of Limbrook's, uh, their own personal depression during the depression. Huge pit was built right here on Langdon Place. And the water would go into that, but unfortunately, the water table was so high that it filled right up and began to flow down into municipal lots and created Lake Sunrise once again. And so the business was forced to close, a victim both of the economic depression and the depression that wouldn't hold the water overflow. As things became desperate in Limbrook and around Long Island, a number of organizations saw an opportunity. Communists, socialists, Nazis. They all had parties on Long Island. And indeed, the socialists came into Limbrook and had a big rally at Five Corners that drew a dozen people. That's all. Nazis came through. They had the headquarters over in New Hyde Park. They drove their cars through the center of town in Limbrook with their banners festooning the automobiles, swastikas on the cars. Again, no one paid too much attention in Limbrook. Communists came through too. They tried to hold a rally and virtually no one showed up. And so Limbrook uh, made it through that difficult time without falling victim to any of those uh, social groups. Sadly, in 1935, an opportunity was presented to Limbrook, which we could have been the beneficiaries of even today, and it was lost. That was the year that the village fathers realized that next door to us in Rockville Center, they had a wonderful power generating plant, electricity generating plant. And a plan was drawn up for Limbrook to do the same. In fact, all the economic analysis said it's the right thing to do. It would pay for itself in just a few years. Bonds could be issued, and the amount that residents would save would more than pay back the bonds. It was a no-brainer. But that year, 1935, saw tremendous values falling in property values. The total assessment value of the city fell dramatically. And so the Board of Trustees decided to defer the decision and then came the war, and it was forgotten, and it was no longer economic. And so we missed the golden opportunity to have a power plant like Rockville Center has today that saves them a fortune in electric bills. In the late uh, 1930s, things started to rebound in Lindbrook and Long Island. World War II was coming. Plants such as Grumman Aircraft or Public Aircraft were being opened and were given government contracts. And little by little, Limbrook got back on his feet. But the memory of the terrible times that Limbrook had gone through lasted for a long time. There was a uh, deep, deep impression on the residents. And we feel some of those effects even today. But fortunately, we're not now in anything like the Great Depression that Limbrook went through, and hopefully we never will. I'd like to thank you for watching this installment of a few minutes of Limbrook history. This is Art Matson, Limbrook Village Historian.
If you'd like to learn more about Limbrook during the Depression, there's a book, The History of Limbrook, at the Limbrook Public Library.